So, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers, and it is the 14th of December, 2011, and we're waiting for a few people to join us, but um, we're here, and so we thought we'd get started. Well, this is an ongoing conversation, starting with bouncing off of um, a book by Deborah Fries and Margaret Wheatley called Walk Out and, or Walk Out, Walk On. Um, we talked about it last week and we have some plans to continue talking about it in the future. Um, Deborah Freeze might be able to join us somewhere in the middle of January. So, um, well. January 18th, possibly. Yeah. So we have um, Heidi Hess, Hess Gable, who just walked out by Heidi. <laughs> I heard the door knock. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's what we get for working with creative people here. They come and go as as we go. Here. But um, oh, let's, so let's. I stay sitting here. I'm not creative. All right. So, and Chris Sloan has joined us from Salt Lake hey, City. Chris. Welcome, Chris. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you fine. Let me yes. do something here. There we go. Okay. Chris, how you doing? Good, kind of a crazy night. Um, I do, uh, you know, one of my jobs is video around here. And so we're filming three different events, and uh, one of the kids called me and said that the battery was dead. So I just had to run and get a battery from one of our kids and get it to another kid. Because they're all on campus, just different events. Mm -hmm. So you're in Salt Lake. Do you connect with David Wiley at all? Um, you know, I only know him. I've never talked to him. I know only know of him, I should say. I never talked to him uh, in person. I th we should get him here on here sometime. Yeah. That'd be great. Because he's doing some interesting stuff. Of course. And he says that we could be teaching the world that policy is getting in the way. Mm. So I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because he does the, on the Utah Online High School, I think. Right. Yeah. Last I heard, it's, yeah. The only mm -hmm. online high school that's open source is what I've heard. I think that sounds right, yeah. Yeah. And, Chris, you have a presidential candidate in Salt Lake City, too, don't you? You know, his son was actually, uh, I, I taught him last year, and so he was kind of my uh, unofficial Chinese tutor last year. This is Rock, Rocky Anderson, is that right? Oh, 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 there's actually a couple. I, yeah, well, who's Rocky the other? Anderson's kid, I taught him too. Yeah. Okay. Who's but the yeah, other? Rocky I don't. just announced his candidacy. Yeah. Oh, Huntsman. Oh, oh him. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, can okay. you speak Chinese? Uh, a little bit enough to do kind of a conversational intro, you know? A little Wo Hen Hao and uh, Wo Shui Zhong Wen. Like that I'm trying French. to learn Chinese. That's French. That sounds Chinese. French. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Heidi, why hey, don't you Heidi, introduce... Let's talk to her before she leaves again. Yeah, really. <laughs> introduce yourself, Heidi. Welcome. And tell us, um, you know, what you've read in the book. We have other people uh, joining name... us as we speak, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah. My name is Heidi Gable. I am at HHG on Twitter. And I am a parent. I'm a, 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 actually the president of the district parent council here in my district, have been for three and a half years. Also working as a consultant in uh, mostly around ed tech within districts. And uh, so far, reading the book, um, just really, really enjoying that uh, the, the sharing around how we're moving outside of the current system and um, not necessarily having to destroy what we've got or, you know, just that whole idea of, of sharing ideas and um, connecting and sharing, you know, really what we do on Twitter really well, but how do we start to now move that further of connecting people, networking, um, growing our ideas and innovation and stepping out of the box. I love what Monica does and I think that's been the best part of our conversation so far is hearing about her, her school there. Hey, Heidi, tell us about this District Parent Council. Uh, what would you like to know about it? it well, is, you, you said it's gone on for three years. What is, is it 
what is its function? Like what? Oh, it's been um, the so it's called DPAC, so District Parent Advisory Council oh, within okay. within our provincial. Um, I guess it would be comparable to what your PTAs or PTOs are. I we think. actually have DPAC, so I okay. I, okay. Yeah, so that's what it is, and I've just been the president of it for the last three and a half years in my district. Okay. So a lot of, you know, working on um, collaboration and relationships and building what those relationships look like rather than uh, getting caught up in anything that's more adversarial, which is what I find our system tends to be um, too often. Do you have a lot of parents participating? Uh, we have, we tend to use that uh, networking kind of model. So we have somewhere around 80 to 100 parents who attend our monthly meetings. And then they all belong to schools and then they work with their school communities and help to have, you know, start conversations at that level. So in our district we have uh, just over 30,000 students. So, you know, we're probably looking not not 30,000 families, but maybe somewhere around 25,000, 20,000 families. So. so one more question before we say, hey, Anne, and hey, Marianne, and hey, Scott's son. <laughs> or maybe we should do it now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, guys. Hi. Hello. Sorry, Welcome, I'm late. Everybody. I'm That's trying cool. to Fine. put something together and got so, caught up in it. Heidi, the conversation that the book is um, creating and um, fulfilling, I guess. Uh, is there is the conversations that the parents are having anywhere near that, or does um, it resemble that in any way, or? It, it resonates with people. I think that it's really hard for parents to understand um, what that's going to look like to actually walk out and to walk on to a model like yours. And I mean, even we've had a couple of conversations on Twitter that sort of touch on some of that. Uh, okay, well, but, you know, how is this, how is this no curriculum kind of model going to prepare my child for university? Or what's the job market going to look like when they get there? And how would... You know, there's a lot of fear and anxiety, I think, for parents around just how do I know? How is somebody going to guarantee? And I mean, sometimes this is up here anyways, the, the push sometimes for a standardized test is how do I know that my kid's doing okay and they're going to be okay in the long run? And changing that conversation from one of how do we guarantee it to how do we learn to have faith in ourselves and foster our own creativity and strengths and then trust that we will find our way into the world that we come into. And that's a very different conversation. And uh, yeah, some, some people are ready for it and some people aren't. And we just sort of keep, I keep oh, you know, raising those kinds of ideas and asking questions and, and really trying to get parents to think. Our province is going through a whole review that we've got a, an ed plan that's come down from our ministry and trying to get feedback from everyone in the province, all you know, parents, teachers, students, and it's been a really interesting kind of process, but still very much in the box. I mean, we're not walking out yet, and that's what it's, really interests me. It's so ironic that the thing that's keeping us from this is the thing that's the scariest happening right now. You know, it's like they want guarantee, and this is all of us, so the they thing isn't there, but we're, mm -hmm. we're looking for guarantees and we're looking for safety and we're in a very unsafe place right now, and there's yeah. definitely no guarantees, you know. So it's just, you know, if we zoom out and look at ourselves, it's we're pretty silly people. <laughs> yeah, but maybe that's why we hold on to it the tightest, right? It's because we're trying so hard to create something that we just can't. We just can't create. We can't have a guarantee, and everyone wants it because we want to know that our kids are going to be okay. I really liked the part in the book, I mean, it, it, again, resonate is a better word, um, when they were talking about um, foreign aid and how we haven't been successful. Mm -hmm. And correct me if, if it was something else I was reading, but um, I'm pretty sure it was the book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how it, it's about us going in and helping, and it's, it's a good-hearted thing. We want to help people. But we don't realize that that's just creating dependency. You know, whatever we end up doing, again, I'll refer to Jacqueline Novogratz's um, The Blue Sweater. That was the first time that I'd really got the idea that you really have to go to that culture and let those people be themselves and facilitate them being themselves as opposed mm -hmm. to 
feeling like you're going to go help. I mean, it's a good feeling to help people, but that's an enabling thing that's not beneficial. And just, just the thing that it talked about how if you look at foreign aid over the years, we are not being successful, you know. And I see that, you know, played out in the school system as well. It's we want to help kids and for ourselves, and we're doing the, the worst thing for us, making us more dependent. So let's do some more introductions here, guys. Scott, who's that with you? Oh, hold on. This is my daughter, Kelsey. She was here last week. Hi, Kelsey. Different hairdo, just out of the shower. <laughs> Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Oh. And I'm a student teacher in Indiana, like currently working in third grade. And a parent. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, well. Kelsey, do you have one of those balls that you sit on and bounce while you're working at home? No. I took it to school. You better work out a deal with your dad. <laughs> Let's. What do you uh, think about that? I've definitely never seen it done before. Something new and interesting. Scott's got those balls in his classroom for mm -hmm. kids to sit on. So, you know. I think, hold on, where is it? This one? And Pam and Marianne. Oh, wait, there it is. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There it's it is. on. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Is that your classroom? It is. Wow. What beautiful space. He was on, he was on TV this week. Wow. wow. Uh, local news show with the request of a chiropractor. We, we have a chiropractor that's up really on our side with these oh, exercise nice. balls. And, and with a, a little bit of marketing, we convinced the, the TV station to come down and do a little story on our classroom. It looks wonderful. Thanks. What was What was the marketing? How did you do that? Um, the my cooperating teacher, her husband's in marketing and was at an event where the local news station was at and he kind of leaned on the reporter a little bit said, hey, you really need to go see this and he <laughs> also does some marketing for the chiropractor. So it was you know right place at the right time that you know, they finally convinced him it was different enough that you should, should come see. Hey, Pam, can you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Pam Moran <laughs> and I am on the couch. <laughs> uh, I just uh, walked back in from a parent council tonight, which is where all of our representatives meet from all of our 26 schools to talk about their work and what what's going on in the schools. And so I just left and Paula White was there with her kids doing a uh, demonstration of digital fabrication. And it's interesting looking at, at the uh, video of the kids because I was just in her room and she's got bean bags and balls and has got these new connecting tables. So, I, and you know what, we've been talking about that our classes that are using those balls, that the kids' posture is just amazingly different and they are, it, it's so much easier for the teachers to figure out when kids need to be able to kind of move on to something else mm. because they see the kids moving on the balls. It's pretty cool. So it's great. It's, I love this classroom. Yeah, and one of the neat things is, I mean, yeah, they move a lot, but and there's no kid that sits and taps a pen, and nobody snaps right. their gum. Mm -hmm. It's, it's That's, a full, full body and fidget. They, but and no, no, no noise. No. It's kind of peaceful. Hey, Delaney, do you want to see this classroom? Come look at this classroom. My Go son. Yeah, my son in kindergarten last year, they had the balls as well. And, you know, you think, okay, kindergarten kids, well, it was K and 1, and you'd think they'd be fiddling around or playing with them or whatever, but they didn't. They were, you know, the teacher just set out the, the expectations at the beginning of the year, and they loved it. And, and particularly, I noticed the boys were much more engaged in stuff they were doing somehow, I guess maybe because hmm. they're, you know, using their body, the kinesthetic piece. So. Yeah. Let me, I have a another video. It's a... A time lapse. It's five minutes of our our first child on the ball when we first did it. So mm -hmm. let me switch off and I'll bring that back in just a second. Okay. Well, he's doing that. Um, yeah. Marianne, introduce yourself. Marianne, please sure. go Hi, ahead. Hi everyone. Um, Marianne, 
Um, I also am, well, I'm not sitting on a sofa, but I'm sitting in a really comfortable chair and um, coming to you from New Jersey. Um, I don't have any of those balls in my house, but I, they certainly look um, intriguing enough to want to get one. Um, and um, looking forward to hearing everybody, um, you know, tonight, um, the conversation, wherever the conversation goes, quite frankly. Why don't you kick it off with something? What, what's the latest thing that you've that's gotten you going crazy over the book? Um, well, I'm, I'm just at the end of Greece. Um, so, um, and Monica, the section that you just referenced, I think I just read. So um, I remember being surprised that the history of U.S. involvement in, in sending foreign aid wasn't successful. That surprised me to, I mean, it, it didn't surprise me on some levels, but that it was deemed a failure, you know, like annually at, at millions and millions and millions of dollars, maybe even billions of dollars, I don't even remember the figure at this point, um, really, um, uh, you know, just just put in perspective for me the whole idea that, you know, this notion of doing unto others as a way of being in the world is so faulty. And, you know, we, ha we see it on very, I mean, you can see it just in a neighborhood of how you interact with your neighbors or how um, in school systems um, educators interact with other educators or um, the divisions between um, sometimes how educators think of parents or parents think of educators. Underneath all of that is that whole sort of level of almost um, we don't see each other as equals and um, and I think that creates some very, very, um, very faulty premises. And then what startled me about the book is how you can now see how those premises get played out at a national and international levels um, at extraordinary cost to human beings and extraordinary cost to um, economics. Um, for, for and, and it's a disaster. I mean, I can see it in schools. I can see it... Um, certainly in the aid and it all sort of circles back I think and, and I'm sort of circling here but I think what it circles back to is the misunderstanding um, that you can stand outside of a, of a complex system and think it's complicated and take complicated measures and think they're and, and in fact they look fabulous from where you're standing but they in fact create other kinds of ripples you can't anticipate and I just think that's sort of the story of this last century has been we keep failing to learn that um, well, and I we see keep that replicating it. If we really back now zoom back in and between teacher and student, we, 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 we talk about the things that the students should do or we want for mm -hmm. the student and it's we're talking about ourselves, you know, right. and um, or we're not we're not realizing they just they need you know something to be moving you know or you know it's just I I can see it going back and forth back and forth those gyrations of let's look globally okay let's go look at the classroom the student and the teacher and there's so many correlations that's I think why the book is resonating mm -hmm. so much with me and I have mm -hmm. to throw out again Carol Black's School in the World um, with that um, foreign aid piece. Um, there was a, a, a great relationship there. And can you introduce yourself? I think you're the last one now. Sorry, I'm trying to get caught up on something that has to be in tomorrow, so I, I was a little <laughs> um, distracted. Uh, my name's Anne. I'm, I'm in right outside Philadelphia right now, in Bucks County. And um, as you can see, I'm a little scattered today, but I'm yes. loving the book. Um, I was in Africa, and I was finding it fascinating about the spiral gardens and how they use the water, the runoff, to um, off the roof and how they plant the gardens in strategic places and how they use the, the um, I guess, the human waste to, you know, to Grow start to, to build up, yeah, like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow, you know, 
but for a land that's not, not fertile, and when you were talking about all those, the aid that came in, and they kind of just took out that whole piece about people learning how to take care of themselves, it was really fascinating to me. Too. Well, and using our quick fixes and not realizing that their land destroyed is way different than our land destroyed, you know, yeah. and so. Mm -hmm. But they Great. have such a simplicity that we don't, which is really kind of another thing that really strikes me about the book. You know, we're always so hurried up and go here, and I feel like when we go in and try to, you know, force our way on someone, we don't, we don't see who they are. We just right. see who we are. Well, so. and my kids have said time and again, it's like you, you think you're going to go help, and you come away being, you're the one that needed to help, you know, because right. you didn't see what the essence of life was about. You know? Really? It and that's the way I feel reading it. Right, exactly. It's what part body. of Africa does it reference? South Africa. Uh, yeah, South Africa, Africa, then Zimbabwe as well, right? Mm -hmm. My cooperating teacher is going to Liberia this summer to do some work. <laughs> Scott, did you want to show that video? Yeah, whenever you're ready. It's 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 queued up, but I didn't want to interrupt the conversation. If, if you Go want for to it. See it. Now I can pop it. Just a second. Let me share the screen again. Uh, it's supposed to be easy, right? <laughs> no, not really. There we go. Okay, here we go. I don't, we don't we don't hear anything, so no. you'll have to narrate. Okay, th this was the the first day I put the first student on a ball. This it's not moving and, yet, by the way. No, um, she would she oh, would be. never sit at her desk. She would always stand. She was my little dancer, and, mm -hmm. and she would always stand up and move. But if you watch her, she fidgets, fidgets. But when it's time to write, watch her perfectly still, perfect posture, and and. She, and night and day difference in her handwriting and her engagement but she just works out the wiggles you know when I was pregnant I wrote read a book because I was having twins and I, we thought one was a boy and one was a girl and so I was reading this book about each kind you know and the book about the boys said if you if you want to end up talking to your your son you need to be shooting hoops with him he needs to be active in order to be able to talk, you know. And I found that to be true. I don't know if it's just me and it was just that book, but... And maybe, again, now we're not even talking gender. Yeah, I, yeah I've, I've noticed that with my students. I mean, and if you watch the other ones off to the right side, you can see everybody's got a leg moving or everybody's slumps. And, and yeah, it, it's... I think it's pretty gender neutral. I mean, it, it's more their, just their personality. I don't mm -hmm. think it's... You know, I mean, it's not, you know, pink and blue and Barbie dolls and G.I. Joe. It's it's not that solid of a line. Yeah, we're all thumbprints, right? You bet. So, Scott, Thanks. That's great. was this your cooperating teacher's idea to bring these balls in, or where did the idea come from? Uh, it was kind of mine. I, I had seen something on it on the Internet, you know, of a few others, and um, I, I watch a lot of... Uh, different web shows. I'm a tech head and um, if you're familiar with Leo Laporte in the Twit Network, mm -hmm. um, he's sat on a yoga ball for years and, and he, you know, you know, very proud to display his ADD on his sleeve and it's, you know, an asset in the business that he does and, and he, he really likes sitting on the yoga ball and, you know, and I, I've sat on one at my desk a few times so I, I thought I'd give it a try. I and, and I got some other neat things. Scott, oh, can, can I ask uh, about that community, that elementary school where you are? I mean, are you? How many more weeks? You're almost done there, right? Yes, I, I finish up the Thursday before Christmas. Okay, but I've got to say I've been impressed with how much they seem rhizomatic in some way. They learn from you. You brought a lot to the class. It's been a back and forth kind of thing. Do you think that's true of that community, or why do you think? Um, yeah. 
it's of just of that classroom. I, I mean, the, the school in general is pretty open for each teacher to use their own teaching style. In the room that I'm in, this teacher is very project-based oriented. She's, you know, everything's differentiated even down to the weekly spelling lists. The, the children, there's several different spelling groups. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, she has a special ed background, but this is a, an inclusive classroom. Um, the mathematics is inquiry based, science is inquiry based. It's, um, we started out the year we took away their textbooks. The only book they have is their language book, and we use that about twice a month. We don't use the basal readers, everything's, we, we read real books instead of parts of books. I mean, the textbooks are still in the room, but they're reference materials. They're not, you know, get, okay, get out the book. And yesterday it was page 82, so today's page 83. We don't do it that way. And, you know, and it's, when we write, we, you know, we, I helped her set up a blog and we have half the class volunteered to stay in lunch recess three times a week. We have a writer's club and they, they come in and they write just for fun and we publish it online and we've discovered how much a global audience makes a difference since when you put it in the hallway it's one thing but if you put it out for everybody for in the world to read they they write quite a bit better um and what was the other thing we did? oh when we took away their desks if if you remember the the first video most of them were sitting at tables you know we don't have textbooks why do we need desks so whoever volunteered all their equipment's just in a little drawer. Their folders, their papers, their pencils. And mm -hmm. If you need something, you go get it, and you sit wherever. And if you need a tool to do your job, you use it. Wherever you need to be pr to be productive, go sit there. Do you think you'll be able to find a place where you can teach like that again? I, that's my plan. I, I have a full-time job right now. It's... So when I'm talking to schools, I'm inter interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing me. So I, I, I can be a little selective. Right? My big thing is I'm racing the calendar. I, I need to find something in the next year or two. So I, this is my retirement job. So. What are you looking for when you interview a school? Um, I, I want to, you know, I, I realize I'm going to be a first-year teacher. I, I know I'm not 22 and... I, starry-eyed. I've, I've seen the world and I've seen part of the ugly side and I, I don't have the rose-colored glasses but I realize I am a first-year teacher. Uh, come on, I, I'm going to want... Get those glasses. Uh, eh, I, I'm going to need a mentor. I'm going to need some support but yet I want some freedom. I don't want to be fighting the school filter all the time. I don't want to be told I have to teach out of the basil and you know I'll do the standardized tests, but, but you know I, I don't want to be in a lockstep curriculum. So you know, public school may not be the place for me. I may need to find a private school where there's a little more freedom. But but I, I I've seen what creativity can bring to the classroom, and I I, I want a place that's not going to beat that out of me or my children. Come to Virginia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we've got we've got a few people you would love to work with. So yeah. I'm gonna jump I'm gonna jump back towards the book and, and yeah. share something that totally resonates with me that kind of is fitting here and then I want you guys to jump in and maybe share something that's really resonating with you. I just keep hearing in my head, sometimes efficiency just isn't the point. You know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a that's a good launching point here of um, where the book's taken you maybe or um, If there's a long pause, I'll keep talking. <laughs> I just blogged about um, sort of the challenge of efficiency as, um, you know, as, a, as, again, I think it just goes back to what I was saying before, the whole, when you see the world in a particular way, and, 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 and I think we all see the world in particular ways, but when your particular way does not even allow you the possibility that there may be alternatives to your view, um, you know, I think we enter very dangerous ground. And the efficiency piece, you know, has, you know, been with us for well over a hundred years. So, 
we still, even when we talk about leaving the industrial age behind, um, I mean, I think the Common Core standards is is an attempt at efficiency. There's, um, you know, two people who've decided that they could name what was most important for millions of children to know, and um, and that it is more efficient to have this at a national level, even though they say it's state, you know, because it's it's state run, but. Um, but it is very national. You know, when you have 45 states, it sort of feels national to them. Um, but that whole idea that, you know, we can do something better if we can be more efficient at it, um, isn't proven. I mean, we, we don't do things better by being more efficient. I mean, more efficiency oftentimes leads to less creativity, less innovation, less breathing. And I thought that came very, you know, it was very clear in the book. In fact, it led me to the next book, um, the reference to the ecology text um, that I guess Deborah makes. Um, I went online and read as much as I could um, from Google Scholar, so which means I'm reading like pages 1 to 18 mm -hmm. and then in that pages 11, 13, and 16 are missing, which actually is kind of an interest. I'm kind of enjoying reading it that way. I'm not sure what that means, but um, but that whole I just think the efficiency thing is really um, important for for us to take a look at, especially inside education. Uh, it does not serve us well. I agree, and and it's interesting because um, I had a, an older gentleman that retired uh, from schools at age 88. <laughs> uh, and literally died on the job. It was kind of one of those things where he worked till he just died. But he gave me a book, and I was reminded of it as I was reading in this. It's called The Cult of Efficiency by Callahan. It was published like in the early 1960s, right around 1960. But it really documents the, the, the whole development of how efficiency became a code word inside our, our schooling system mm -hmm. that just basically said what we're going to do is to create a cheap labor force by working towards kids that will be efficient in their work and then move into a workforce where they can apply that same sort of focus on efficiency on the factory floor. And it, it just struck me that, that the other quote in this book, it's kind of a that stuck in my mind was, I think it was in the Brazilian one that said, we've forgotten who we are. And that phrase really resonated with me because I am reminded almost daily when I see situations where across this country, people feel like that they are so compelled towards the, uh, the, the top down federally driven mandates that we're in that are very much rooted in efficiency that in many cases that people have just forgotten who we are as humans and what learning really is when it's occurring in a really humane and human way. Mm -hmm. And that has been kind of a real theme for me of just, you know, is the system so broken with this efficiency model that there's nothing we can really do to, to ever pull out of it? A phrase that's both in this book and in Carol Black's Schooling the World is what does it mean to be fully human and alive? So mm -hmm. I hear that in my head all the time as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I'm really, you know, when you talk about the efficiency, one of the things that comes to mind for me is also just the, really it's sort of a, an efficiency piece for us personally, and whether that's teacher with student or whether that's parents with their kids, often what I see and I felt for myself with my kids is I have so much to do, there's so much pressure, Sometimes it's pressure I put on myself, but there's so much, it's overwhelming, that there is this tendency to go to what's going to be easiest in the moment. Like, how do I, you know, get my kids to behave so we can get to the next activity, or we can, you know, sit at the table so we can get our food done. And in a way, that's a piece of that sort of mindset about efficiency. And um, notice how, how, how conscious I have had to be as a parent to choose not to serve the needs of the moment, but to balance that with my longer term, what do I want, how do I, you know, how do I teach my kids to do the right thing for the right reason, not because I'm telling them to do it right now. Um, that takes a lot more energy and a lot more work and a lot of consciousness. So to me, it's, it's almost that moving from 
efficiency in doing, you know, doing what's expected or what's by default to a level of consciousness and openness of keeping in mind what the bigger picture is and what those longer term goals are so that I can make different choices in the moment. So the book puts efficiency um, next to resilience. Mm -hmm. um, can, can anybody talk about what that is? I haven't gotten to that section yet. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just start it off. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about resilience, resilience in a system is that the system can adjust um, to perturbations, to things that are happening that are, un are unexpected. So a system that's resilient is a system, uh, in, in a complex system, is a system that can make adjustments sort of on the fly. Um, how it counters, um, or how it's, how systems become less resi resilient is that in efficient um, models, um, efficiency rests on a belief of stability. And so there's a, a belief system that says things are, things are going to be remaining fairly stable because we're controlling so much. And of course, nothing complex can really remain stable whether, you know, you order it to do that or not. And um, I think one of the points in, in, in this text, and certainly they borrow greatly, and, and say they're borrowing greatly from the, um, the, the text, um, and, and I'm thinking of the, the person's name, well, I can't remember the person's name, but I, I, when I, I'll look for it in a second. Mm -hmm. But um, just the idea that um, you know, you're going to have this, um, you're going to lessen the resiliency of a system um, simply by caging it. And so you have a fallout, you have something that happens, and instead of being able to respond to it, you're so locked into this efficient system that you no longer have the means, the mechanism, or as we've read in the book, you've depleted the land. You've created, you know, ecological kinds of hazards that didn't have to be created, but were created out of the efficiency. And the system, the land itself, can't be resilient in that um, because it's been so depleted. I see it in public schools. If you continue, and, and I don't mean you personally, you and the, and the, me, everyone, if we continue to, to um, really demean what it means to teach, um, to publicly um, you know, hold up to ridicule um, educators, um, the resilience that has been part of what it means, I mean, to be an educator means to be resilient. It, you know, things don't always go well. Um, part of that job is, you know, recapping and, and trying it again. If trying it again isn't efficient, um, I, I think we're, we're really going down a very slippery slope for, um, you know, who we attract into this field and who wants to remain. Um, I think I think as other options come up to people, they may well take them in ways that I don't know that, um, you know, 10 years ago would have been the case. Did, I don't know if that was clear or not, but just that they, they coexist, efficiency and resilience, and when they're out of balance, when things are too efficient, the system cannot be resilient. It doesn't have the means. Yeah, that makes me think of Carol yeah. Dweck and um, the whole, that mindset of, you know, the whole things that appear to be not efficient or really bad, that is where, that is where you should be swimming and, and loving it and, you know, knowing that that's making you stronger and we, we run from that, you know. And that's what's making us more dependent, and that is resilient. Um, we just have that mindset all backwards. Yeah, I wanted to test a quick idea that what I've been noticing is that students who are quote unquote less than successful are really just slower <laughs> at, <laughs> at getting things done. You know, I had a Isn't kid. True? I had a kid tonight who just, you know, stayed an hour and a half to finish um, a, a post that he was putting up, and I wanted him to get it done in 50 minutes during class, and he just couldn't get it done that fast. So I'm just wondering, you know, 
I, there's an efficiency that I'm looking for always, but. What is what is, I mean, who's deciding what he wants to do? I mean, yeah, it, he could be slower, but it's, if he's choosing it, maybe maybe we're asking him to do something that's not in him, or maybe we're asking him to do it at a time that's not his, mm -hmm. the rhythm of his body. You know, you know when he's most creative. Um, I think we, we spend so much time measuring things and labeling things as slow or, and we're comparing it all to something that's not useful to most of us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Faster is not better uh, at most things unless you're in a sporting event. I mean, it's, you know, slow cooked food is better than fast food. It's, you know, a, a piece of art that you take years to do is better than a pencil sketch. It's, the speed's not always the issue. But there is also the other side of it. I have a 13-year-old who is immensely capable, and yet when she feels insecure or when she's feeling like she's being forced to do something, so she had a project recently where it was, you know, trying to do some artwork, and she's very artistic, but artistic in a different way than some of the other kids in the class. And she was comparing herself to how those other kids were instead of doing her own thing. And really, you know, suddenly it became you know, 30 hours of trying to get this project done when it could have been done in 5 or 10. And, and why? Not because she's not capable, but because of the insecurity and comparing herself. And, you know, so there's, there's also that other extreme of where it becomes just painfully too long. Yes, faster would have been much better in this case. And <laughs> the, the next project engaged her in, in it in a way that... Um, engaged her passion, and suddenly it's like, okay, Sophie, we gotta go. Oh, hold on, Mom, I gotta, I gotta Google one more thing, and I noticed this, and and and, and now she's driving the learning and getting it done in a fraction of the time. The the contrast has been dramatic for me to notice that, and it was around her her motivation, not her capability. And I think the Ma Minecraft story really kind of fits into this theme too. Oh. Uh I, you know, it was so funny to me to watch the boys. The other day, they, Devin had set up, uh, Mary Ann's son had set up a um, a Christmas mod. I don't even know what a mod is. They know what a mod is, but that's all I hear all day long is, get me this mod, get me that mod. Um, and they were decorating the houses with lights. They were, you know, building trees and decorating them with lights. They were drinking eggnog and eating fruitcake. <laughs> Connor didn't even know what eggnog was. He had to, like he had to turn around and ask me, you know, what's eggnog? And he does it constantly when he's on the computer and one of the boys types something into either Skype or into the, you know, into the game itself. He's constantly asking me what these words are. What does this word mean? What does, you know, what what is this? Mm -hmm. And for me, like I mean, it's because he really wants to know. You know, he wants Devin to help him set up a server on Minecraft on online and you know I don't know that he's not there yet you know he can't he can't do it you know what I mean but he wants to do it you know the interest is there so you know then it becomes a a, a game of how how do we get him there you know because I don't have the experience that's for sure I can't help him um, but you know and Devin's so patient with him you know what I mean he really he really helps him along and he really they really, I love to listen to them, you know, sure, they have bad moments, you know, like anybody else, but they really play so intensely, you know what I mean? And they're mm -hmm. learning together, and, and, you know, they learn about each other, and they learn about these kids all over the world, so it's, it's, just, it's just a whole different kind of learning. I don't, you know, I wish I could bring it into my classroom, because I think that my... My brilliant kids that re stay up all night reading because I, I gave this one kid, you know, the Ender's Game, and he stayed up all night reading, and he sits in my class like, you know, like he can't stand it because he's I, so smart and he's just not. Nothing challenges him, you know. It's it? not interesting him. Oh, uh, I wanted so. to. Chris kind of Sloan, talk speak up. About Go ahead. Efficiency, just a little bit, because. Um, you know, to share a little bit of an anecdote, like uh, I'm actually in my classroom because I have some kids who want to come in tonight um, because they, uh, you know, did some filming today 
and and they want to show it at an assembly that we have on Friday, and they were told that they had to, you know, get it all edited um, by tomorrow noon. And so for a schedule like this, that presents some challenges. But you know, and maybe I'm splitting hairs, but I think of um, like in this case, I'm wondering like efficiency. One of the problems with efficiency is who's efficiency we're talking about you know like what's your definition of efficiency is it coming from you know some central source because like in this case on a real local level these guys really want to be efficient so they have to be able to compose their stuff really quickly and then edit their stuff and then crunch that you know and get it out and distribute it um, you know and that's really kind of a function of of efficiency and I know I'm thinking of it in a different way but part of me says like you know for stuff like that inefficiency really you know shoots them in the foot and they don't want any part of it so I mean I'm thinking of efficiency on a real local level and I think mm -hmm. when you talk about efficiency in American education where we've kind of blown it is you know when we thought every school was a factory and you know in the early late 19th century, early 20th century, when we started thinking like, okay, well, here's the blueprint to make schools work. You know, so, I mean, I'm just thinking of like these guys tonight are coming in and they're going to be really uh, efficient because they only have about 45 minutes to get all this stuff done. So there's a lot of learning to get to this point and now they're starting to get really good at it. So I, I was just thinking of efficiency in a different way. Well, and I, that's been one of the pushbacks with the stuff that we do is um, along the lines of efficiency or rigor or structure, that the myth is that when you do give freedom out, you know, or let it be per choice, that we're talking now, it, none of that is there, but structure is everywhere, you know, and if, if it's, so you're, I think, you know, you're obviously talking about, does it come from within? that. I can't not be efficient, or is it someone telling you you have to be efficient on this particular thing? You know, there's mm -hmm. a huge difference, and so it's not that we're when you let people choose that they're going to get to be lazy or they're not going to work as hard. They're going to work even harder because it, you know. So yeah, the, on those levels, I think the book is really referencing. I'm coming in, and here's how you're going to be efficient. You know, and that then we're going to measure it by our level of efficiency. You know, so thanks for bringing that out because that's really important. I think that's why people shy away from an idea of, oh, what if the curriculum is just a process of learning to learn, and we let everybody do whatever because they think no one's going to be efficient, no one, it's not going to be manageable, or there's not going to be any structure. You know, so that's a good point. Thanks, Chris. I wonder sometimes about the efficiency aspect around um, labeling or when we talk about going to totally individualized or personalized versus you know what I have I have three kids that all have IEPs um, one is gifted one is gifted LD there's the written output like you start start looking at those kind of things and say, you know I don't need my kid to have a label if we're all treating each child as individuals that's much better but on the flip side of that to manage a classroom um, there is something, you know, there are some commonalities, say, that, that tend to show up in clusters with the, the gifted learner kind of, you know, when you look at that. And knowing what those are and being able to recognize them in kids does help us more quickly be able to, to support them or uh, to, to see where, where we need to work with them or mentor them. And, and so I wonder sometimes, like, are we really moving to a system where we're going to have no classifications or labels or or what's that look like is it is it about not being locked into a label being able to use it as as scaffolding maybe or I'll tell I don't you. know you're, go ahead I, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the factory style of most of the schools that I'm in you know what I mean I've been in so you know several and I don't see any of the freedom that you have. I don't see any of that. And, and I don't, I can't even picture what it would look like because I have never been exposed to it. Even though I crave it, you know what I mean? Because I can't, I find it harder and harder and harder to keep pushing this, this 
factory model because it's not working. You know what I mean? It's not. Kids are different. Kids are different today than than we were. You know what I mean? We sat, we did, we listened. We were supposed to, and that's what we did. You know what I mean? Kids don't do that anymore. Kids and we don't have a whole them to either. No, and I, I mean I don't want them to have to do that either. You know what I mean? So that and we tell them not to be bystanders, and we tell them to speak up and to right. have an opinion. And but the flip side of that is that they don't sit quietly and just obey. Right. And then, then it becomes, okay, so now I still have this factory model of school with 32 kids sitting in this classroom, and me as the teacher, you know, how do I come up with, or how do I get these kids involved in something that's going to keep them all? Because, let's face it, 32 people are never going to do the same thing at the same time and be happy with it. It just doesn't unless, happen. Unless it's now not compulsory where you go and it's per choice and so who's together in a room is per choice. Well, yeah, that, then you could but that's manage. not what I have, right? That's no, not what we that's, have. You have and, and, but you said you can't visualize it and I, because no. of the experiences I've had, that's what's missing because we keep saying things like how do I manage the classroom and how do I bring this into the classroom, but what, from what I've seen, we need to start thinking outside of the classroom right? You know, and we need to start thinking Let's let these gatherings, these community of practices, happen per choice. I mean, to me, that's what tech is bringing us. It's bringing us that opportunity that we can gather per choice. Um, it, it, you know, right off the bat, it doesn't seem easy. But what we're doing right now, I, I don't see a lot of people that are saying this is really easy and it's feeling really good. And you know, <laughs> well, no, that's true. <laughs> It isn't very easy. I'm telling you, it gets harder and harder every year. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, so I, you know. I'll but share you with you something specific that we're we're getting to do. Um, you know, we're doing this kids learning for passion thing, and starting next semester for professional development, we're offering um, for teachers to be a part of this this pie lab that we're placing downtown. And you just go and you sign up and say, I want to learn Portuguese. I want to do graphic design. I want to design bicycles. Whatever. We're trying to crowdsource our town to see, you know, what 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 are the big groups? What what spaces do the people that are there's thirty of them do, do they need? Or what where do we need to put the people who there's only five of them, you know, so that there is no managing going on. I mean it could even be people that there is no expert. So now they bring in virtual Skypes or they Google YouTube together, but they have that same passion and no one's no one's going to pay them, and they're fine with that. And no one's going to give them a grade, and they're fine with that. But then we get the authentic efficiency and the authentic structuring and all that going on. Yeah, but you, it, you need to get the word manage out of your vocabulary. If they're engaged, they don't need to be managed. Right. Exactly. But that's, that's what I'm talking about. You know, how do you take – I mean, I have a mixed level abilities, right? Although, you know, this school is – it, my kids are definitely much more, um, let's consider them proficient, I guess, or advanced. You know, they're a higher level um, learners, but as opposed to my last school. So it, it, you would think it should be easier, and it is in some respects, but it's not better. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and and I, I don't I think know it's going to happen until we start letting it be per choice. Who's together in a room per choice? We are efficient. We're very efficient right now at 30 people in a classroom and, and you know, we've, we've come up with the gaming and the technology and the best ways to trick kids into learning different right. things, giving them rewards. I mean, people paying kids to do well on tests and, you know, they're cheating and we're not really looking at that. Right. So we're, we're pretty efficient at what our mark is. Our mark is to do well on tests and things. and so. I don't think that the thing that we want, that we're walk, reading about and walk out, walk on, is going to happen until we say, this needs to be a per choice who's together in a room, and the compulsory curriculum is what's messing with us. And But you have to have your leader be willing to step outside that managed system, and I don't see a whole lot of educational leaders doing that. Well, in the meantime, just keep empowering your kids to know that everything they need is within them. And 
even in a classroom that seems suppressed. I mean, look at look at people in Africa and developing countries. They are able to find that whatever's with inside of them. So surely we can do it in a classroom in the meantime. But to look at a whole systematic thing. I think we're doing the best we can with 30 people in a classroom, and people are telling us what to do when we're there together. I think our kids are being amazing yeah. to put up with that. Our teachers are being amazing to put up with what they do, and then also be bashed left, you know. So we're doing really, really well. And Kathy Davidson talks about this quite a bit, you know, that for all that we've come through, we're doing really well. Um, but I don't. I think we we need to change up the per choice part. Mm -hmm. Can I, so Monica, I, you don't. Can I? I just wanted to offer another perspective. I mean, uh, Monica, you said there's structure everywhere. I working with transfer students. Um, these are students who have failed in other high schools. I'm finding there's choice everywhere too. <laughs> um, in that. Um, even in traditional classrooms, they choose to get up and walk out a lot. Um, mm -hmm. They, you know, they <laughs> choose to come to school or not come to school. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of choice going on. Um, I want to provide some more positive choice. And it just it just, it's kind of funny, perhaps, but every day I have kids coming to my third period, and I look at my role and I say, "You're not in my third period." And they say, no, I'm in seventh period, but I'm not staying till seventh period, and I want to get your work done. You know, um, that exercising of choice is possible on the edges of, you know, mm -hmm. of the failure in some way. Does that make sense? Yeah, but now, yeah. Look at, now we're, do, we're not doing the full freedom thing. We're not trusting the person to have value right now. We're saying, mm -hmm. here's your ten choices. You know, pick it or pick one that... We're not offering and feel like you're cheating the system. We're not letting them be themselves and truly have the choice. You know? Yeah. So but to I, me, there's a big difference. But I want to guard against um, thinking that we have to give them that choice. I think kids exercise a lot of choice already um, within within these these terrible structures that they're in. Um, and I agree with opening up the structures in lots and lots of different ways. But I want to look at it from their perspective a little bit. I think they do exercise a lot of choice, and and we need to encourage them to keep walking out, um, and find the education that they need to find, if that makes some sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. That last part, I wasn't yeah. really following you. So it, yeah. It takes a lot of strength and I think a sense of self to be able to exercise that kind of choice that you're talking about. Hmm. Well, and then. For those kids. Within it, within the existing system, to make those choices, there, yeah. yeah, it's a hard thing to do. I think that more kids or desperation, than that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. or desperation, yeah. yeah, that you're you've already given up in some way, and you're to a point where it's okay. I have to do something different. Yeah, you know, however that looks. But we we have. I think there's an awful lot of the kids who are in the system and they're so used to that system and, and they crave the success and they crave, you know, they, they crave the adults being, um, I guess, you know, liking what they do, right? They want to be liked, they want to be successful, and therefore they play the game because yeah, the they book, have to. The book talks about our dependency on consumption and I think Likewise, it also talks about how the gift culture, how there's nothing earned in the gift culture. And um, it's those mental spaces of permission that we could be giving them in a classroom now. And a lot of them, like you say, are, are taking us up on them. But my kids are saying, I mean, some in some ways we have it worse than other places because it is, we are... We, become mindless about things and we don't question them, you know, and so we just assume this is what we're supposed to do, but. We should give each other a break is how I like to say this. Um, anybody want to have kind of ending thoughts here? Um, it's, if it's okay, I want to invite anybody who wants to come back next week. Come back next week. I think we'll still be 
a few of us here at least, and we'll keep going in this vein. Um, I did invite somebody. His name is Brian Ingram, and I wanted to say this. He's a teacher down in Texas who was inspired by the um, Occupy Wall Street for the Occupy people where he is in Fort Worth, Texas, to run for Congress. Um, and he's a teacher, and he said, you know, this is my way to sort of walk out. And I, I emailed him and, and told him we were talking about this book, and he's going to get the book. And anyway, so <laughs> inviting some people in, like, who have been inspired to do something different because of what's going on um, as well. But anybody else who, who's on this conversation now want to come back next week. And then we'll also continue it on, it's the 18th of January when Deborah Freeze will be with us as well. So we'll keep this going here and there. And I don't know if you guys are going to continue to meet on Friday, but God bless you. Well, you're right. <laughs> we were going to talk about that. Yeah. I think we forgot to talk about it. Okay. You have well, to work that sure out. Yeah, um, we'll work it out. Scott, thank you for sharing from your classroom and those videos was yeah. great to see. And thanks everybody for your contributions here tonight. Yeah. Um, we, uh, as we sign off here, we always want to say that we have been broadcasting and this will be up at edtechtalk.com um, and at World Bridges, uh, which is a part of worldbridges.net. It'll be at teachersteachandteachers.org and uh, elsewhere, Lab Connections, Blogspot Lab Connections, right? Um, and so thanks to Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier. Um, for all of that. And I think we'll sign off for tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.